love to travel. I know women who made a difference. Aquila Kids give to our community. Welcome to a personal interview of Rachel Gunderson, conducted by Kelsey on April 17th, 2007. Where were you born? I was born in Marshfield, Wisconsin. Do you know where that is? Oh, um, yeah. That? yeah. It, it's pretty much in central Wisconsin, and it's the heart of a farming area, and they make a lot of cheese around the area. It's dairy farming. Um, Kelsey, one thing, can you want to stop that just a minute? Yeah. Okay, um, like tell about your hometown. And okay, well, Marshfield, my father, was a German Lutheran minister. And at that point, he had two little country churches outside Marshfield. So for the first five years of my life, I lived in a farming area. And there, our backyard was full of cows, and, and you go outside barefoot and you'd step in a cow pie sometimes. So that was pretty, that's one of my early memories. One doesn't remember lots of things before you're five years old. Uh, so that was one of my few memories. Then there was the chance to move to La Crosse. And my, the place we were living in in Marshfield was quite primitive. Uh, there wasn't indoor plumbing. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a chemical toilet, um, and well, that's pretty gross, and a pump at the kitchen sink. <laughs> and you know, I don't remember lots of that stuff, but I remember some of those things were pretty primitive. So we were a family of four kids, and my mom, really thought it'd be nifty to move to La Crosse. Well, my dad kind of did too, because La Crosse was a place where he, he had been born. And his father had come to La Crosse in 1884 as a very young man. And had, so that's a very long time ago. Yeah. So my roots in La Crosse go back a long time. He had come from Germany, a part of it's actually Poland now, the part of, oh. it was Germany at that point, it was called Prussia, um, and, and uh, so the northern part of Poland. Mm -hmm. and, um, and he and my grandmother, Gutsky, met in La Crosse, and were married here in La Crosse, and had seven kids all here in La Crosse, wow. <laughs> including my father. My grandfather, Gutsky, and I... Okay, my grandfather Gutsky and grandmother Gutsky is a picture of them right here. And that's how they looked on their wedding. She was only 18 and he was eight years older. But he was a carpenter by training. But after he got here, he, he became a very good carpenter and ended up um, building churches. And two of the churches that he built was one is on West Avenue, right near Aquinas High School. It's a great oh. big red brick Lutheran yeah. church. And he was he wasn't the architect, but he was the builder, the construction manager for that thing. Mm -hmm. So that was in the late 1800s. Then another church that he built was this one, which was oh. the, that's on the north side. And do you know where the yeah. sweet shop is on Caledonia Street? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've been okay. there. Yeah. my favorite place. As a young person, that's where all my babysitting money went. Anyway, <laughs> uh, my grandfather built that church, and then my father came there as a minister. So it was just mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, a circle that was completed. And I was almost five years old at that point uh, when we moved there and that church is still standing there. It's a mm -hmm. yellow brick church on Avon Street and it's kitty corner from um, a Lutheran school. Now I will show you another thing. The Lutheran school, just a minute I marked some pages here. Um, can you tell what the church is? Or what's oh yeah, the church is called Emmanuel Lutheran Church okay. and this shows where the house I grew up in was. Um, and and the, the minister's house was called a parsonage. And some in, in English, in a way, a minister is called a parson. So a parsonage, and that's where you live. That's now been torn down, and something is, mm -hmm. another school has been built. And then that's a school that I went to. And I went oh. to a Lutheran school through eighth grade. Uh, there's a picture here of my man. I 
have this real for numbers here. Set page seven. Okay. All right. Sorry. Oh. I'm just going to like over yeah. a little bit. Okay. Th this just tells a little bit about my grandfather, Albert Goodskin, building that. And what th that church cost $12,000. Can you imagine? I mean, a new house these wow. days cost about $250,000. This yeah. was a whole church for that. It was awesome. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, that's where I grew up. And there's a picture of my dad there too, uh, right there. And that was pretty much at the time that he retired. But he was a minister there for a long, long, long time on the north side. Is your hometown different now than it was like before? In like what ways? Oh, yes. I was born in 1930. Uh, that was the beginning of what was called the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. And La Crosse was very much hurt by that. <clears throat> the north side at that point, uh, they were mostly working people and farmers who belonged to my dad's church. The, um, the, the train that goes through, or the, the train tracks, the train station on the north side, um, trains were a very busy way of traveling at that point. Not everybody had a car, so many people took trains. And there were three major trains that came through across. And the train tracks crossed not far from our house on the north side, mm -hmm. and that was called Grand Crossing. And so during the Depression, um, there were lots of people that we called hobos or bums, and they would hop trains and just travel around. There were so mm -hmm. many people, at least a third of the people in this country didn't have work. And so <clears throat> they just would leave their families and travel, <coughs> excuse me, maybe try to find work, but frequently they did, and then they were kind of escaping, too. Mm -hmm. So a couple blocks from our house, there was kind of a, a little um, hollow um, dugout area near the train tracks, and the hobos would stay there. And part of the fun was to go and crawl down into that area. And we, and we were kind of scared because we didn't want to meet a hobo. You know, we thought that they were something really scary. So, and they probably were. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. um, my girlfriends and I would go down there and we'd think we could find something exciting, like going on a big adventure to find things. We rarely did because the hobos didn't have anything to leave behind. But the other thing was is that they would come and ask. They knew that our house was where a minister lived and ministers mm -hmm. would share things. So they'd put a big X on the sidewalk or on our house, and they would come in and um, ask for food. My mother would never let them in the house, because I think she was a little frightened, too. And they were stinky dirty, most of yeah. them. They had bathed. But they, uh, she would always feed them something or give them some vegetables to mm -hmm. feed them. Uh, we had only one telephone in the house, and that was in my father's study, a sort of office. Uh, we had only one, one uh, radio, mm -hmm. and mostly that was tuned to, he liked to listen to football games and basketball <laughs> games, and then there were uh, radio programs that we listened to, like uh, The Shadow Knows, uh, and we read mm -hmm. comics and newspapers, but uh, there wasn't much for entertainment. Yeah, like iPads now and... Oh, my Lord! <laughs> I mean, we never had... We had a piano in the house, and mm -hmm. I took lessons, but I was never very good at it. I kind of needed to practice, and I just wasn't <laughs> very talented. But um, if you wanted to telephone your friend, your dad was always sitting there at his desk listening to what you were saying. <laughs> it wasn't that kind of privacy. Uh, there were streetcars yet, and as I got a little bit older, uh, the, the streetcars then were all taken out and, and buses took over. Mm -hmm. But some of the fun, some of the boys, probably about your age, what's your name? Mitchell. Mitchell. Some of the boys would go, and the streetcars ran by electric power, and there, were, there was mm -hmm. a wand up from the back of the streetcar to overhead wires. And the boys would sometimes pull that wand off, and then the streetcar couldn't go. And the streetcar conductor would have to get out and be <laughs> cussing and swearing at the kids. And the kids, of course, all disappeared. But then he'd have to put that back on. So what other things? It was, as I say, people were very poor. Mm -hmm. 
uh, there were no supermarkets. There were lots of neighborhood grocery stores and some very nice guys who ran the grocery stores, <coughs> excuse me, or families, that would let the, the people who were out of work mm -hmm. charge food. So a big treat was to get a quart of ice cream from the sweet shop, oh. and my mom would make her own sauce, chocolate sauce and butterscotch sauce, and that was a huge treat. But the cost of things was very cheap, too. You could get an ice cream cone for five cents. A Sunday was 15 cents. <laughs> but a whole wow. night of babysitting, you'd make only 50 cents. Yeah. So all that didn't go very far. Uh, I never learned how to drive. We had one car. There was no driver education in school. So I had we had one car, and uh, that was my dad's car for, for his work never taught any of us how to drive. Did you ever learn how to drive after that? Sure. When I, once once yeah. I got married, then my husband taught me how to drive. Oh. But, so that was good. That's cool. Um, so I was going to ask, what do you do in your spare time? What do I do now? Yeah. Um, well, I'm, I'm an old lady who's tired out, and so I do a lot of reading. I still love to read. And yeah. I like historical fiction. I like history books. Um, I like mm, mystery stories sometimes. So I read a wide mm -hmm. range of things. And I used to do a lot of gardening. I used to play tennis. But in the summer, I inherited a cabin up in northern Wisconsin. And, and it's an old log cabin where I used to go as a little girl. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's been in the family for lots of years. And so we go up there. It's, it's on a lake. It's on a chain of lakes, actually, mm -hmm. a three lakes chain of lakes. And so we spend our time up there. We don't take showers. We swim. Uh, we get clean that way. Yeah. And we do canoeing. We're not in the motor boats and, and <laughs> jet skis and stuff. Yeah. Maybe if we were younger, we would be. But we like canoes and quiet things. Mm -hmm. So uh, what are the nearest? Uh, organizations to your heart, I guess. Or what's that your favorite ones? Somewhere. Well, the one I've been in the longest is the League of Women Voters, and that's mm -hmm. the one that's sponsoring this. Uh, and I was president of the League shortly after we came to the cross. But I've been in the League forever and ever and ever. Uh, and, I, and I still, this year I haven't gone to so many things. But when we were celebrating the 75th anniversary, uh, of the League of Women Voters, uh, Jean Mark, who was interviewed just before I was, and I were in charge of how we were going to celebrate it, and we came up with the idea of the Women's History Book, and saying that the histories of lacrosse were mostly about men, and they hardly mentioned women. So Jean and I had been active in all kinds of women's organizations, and we said, mm -hmm. it's time we start telling what women did because women did lots of things, they just didn't get the publicity. Yeah. So we got we, we got going and got money to support the publishing of that women's history book called For the Common Good. Um, and then this project is a follow-up mm -hmm. on that because we made money selling that book. And there was money to, I think, buy you some equipment for this project. Mm -hmm. And the book went up to just all oh, the early 1970s. And so we had hoped that eventually somebody, some organization, somebody would follow up on that and keep bringing it up to date. Mm -hmm. And so your two teachers yeah. thought this was a good idea, and bingo, here we are. <laughs> are you enjoying this? Yeah, yeah, we are. Are you? I, I'm enjoying talk, or talking with you and get, like, um, having an interview. So what made you volunteer in the first place? Like, did oh, you just want them to like, help out? Or? Yeah. Um, th th there were several different things. For instance, when we, w we lived lots of different places, 14 different places before we came back to the cross. My husband and mm -hmm. I were married in, well, I was in my senior year or before my senior year in Madison. We were both students he had just finished and mm -hmm. uh, was waiting around to go to medical school. Then we went to medical school, internship, residency. He was in the service. 
we lived in, in lots of different places, San Francisco, Texas, mm -hmm. Boston, Germany for a couple of years. And uh, so we lived lots of different places. And in all of that time, I didn't do much volunteer work. I was having lots of kids, too, and five kids kind of keep busy. Um, and my husband wasn't around very much to help mm -hmm. raise the kids. But anyway, um, so once we got back to La Crosse, I was really eager to get involved in the community. We were so happy to be back here. We thought La Crosse was a great place to raise our kids. We were so lucky. We found an ancient house in Ebner's Cooley that uh, we added on to after we lived in it for a year. It's on the hillside, and our land goes up to the top of the bluff, to the Granddad Bluff Park, and it was a great place to raise a bunch of kids. The big field there, yeah. the neighborhood kids all played ball there. But I was appalled at the school district. So yeah. we got going in all kinds of education volunteer things. There were many different committees to help improve mm -hmm. the school district. Um, my brother was involved in theater, and I had always liked theater. So I became very active in the community theater, and I was on that board several times and president of it several times. Um, I, over time, uh, oh, and another thing, one of my sons, number four son, was very artistic and there was nothing. The school district had very few art classes. So I helped uh, have summer art classes in the cross. And uh, you know, so that it was those things where I felt needs in the community. And then also, the longer I worked, well, I'll, I'll just kind of summarize that by saying, then as the kids got older, I decided I was tired of working from the outside, and I wanted to work in the school mm -hmm. system. At that point in the early 70s, drugs were a big problem. They were just moving into La Crosse in the late yeah. 60s and early 70s, and, and parents would show up by the hundreds at meetings that schools put on uh, about drugs because they didn't know anything about it. Well, so down the line, I decided the best way to do something, and it's for me to go back to school and be further trained and get a job in the school district and work from inside out. Um, on that note, um, what was it like going to back to school and like? Um, it was tough. I'd been out of school for 20 years. I still had four kids at home going to school, yeah. and my husband was a pediatrician, and he was gone a lot of the time. He mm -hmm. worked 60, 80 hours a week. Um, so I was mainly in charge of the kids, and I had forgotten algebra completely. Oh. I, I had to take a course in what's called statistics, which is a really tough course, and I had to yeah. I had to know algebra for that. So my kids taught me, retaught me algebra, oh. and fortunately they were pretty good at math and they could help me. That's but good. I think that it was really good for them to see me value education, say, hey, this is important, and if I'm going to school, I want to get something out of it, and and so I'm going to study, too. So mm -hmm. we all did studying, and they knew that I valued education. Mm -hmm. So what did your job involve um, as, a school as a school psychologist? School psychologists, psychologists study individual behavior. So how do you study that? You study that by observing people, by observing students, mm -hmm. and by looking at samples of their performance. So what are some samples of your performances? Um, report cards. <laughs> okay, but, but they, they just tell you, uh, you know, how well you've done. Oh, yeah. But what would be some, what, what goes into the grades on the report cards? All your assignments. Mm -hmm. assignments. Yes, your assignments. Your effort. Yeah, the amount of effort that you show, whether you learn fast or slow, uh, how you learn, whether you learn better by listening, by seeing, uh, if you need to copy things lots of times before you remember it, or learn quickly, 
uh, all those kinds of things. How you interact with other people, how well you suck up to teachers, as you said, Mitchell, um, whether being interacting with your friends is more important, uh, what your special talents are. Are you good at music, art, athletics? Uh, are you a math whiz? Do you learn languages quickly? So that's part of what we did. And, and we serve as a member of a group that made dis educational decision, decisions about whether you needed special education, uh, like learning disability, speech and language, emotional problems. Uh, retardation, hearing impaired, visually impaired. Do you work impaired. with kids with cancer then? Or uh, not, no. Not, okay. not usually that, although any any child with a, a se severe, serious illness is going to need changes in what is expected of that child in mm -hmm. school because there are going to be lots of absences, There, there's going to be fatigue, there's going to be lots of mm -hmm. things. Uh, so, it, but then in addition to that, I, I liked working, especially middle school was my favorite time. Okay. And, and uh, because middle school students, I think, are still enough young that they're, they can show excitement, they, they, uh, they don't have to be cool all the time, right? I mean, sometimes yeah. you have to be cool, but they don't have to be cool all the time. And so I love that, that kind of freedom and that interest mm -hmm. in things. And we're going over time almost. Oh, we are? Are we? Are we? Mm -hmm. No, okay. No? Okay. We have an hour and a half. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and then the other thing that I did, lacrosse was starting what they call the student assistance program. So that any student in the school that had, had needs other than special education needs could get help through guidance office, through um, social workers, school psychologists, school nurse. And so I was a part of that team. And especially at the high school level, the things that I was well known for was helping prevent suicide, helping prevent unwanted pregnancies, mm -hmm. uh, helping kids keep kids away from becoming addicted to drugs and alcohol. Um, I, I became fairly well known because I had to learn about it in order to help kids. Mm -hmm. uh, about homosexuality, because there were some gay and lesbian students that were being oh, just harassed out of the place. and, and uh, they were high risk of suicide. Mm -hmm. So I, I learned about that. I tried to educate other staff members about that. And I talked in health classes about, about mm -hmm. sexual diversity. And um, so I did some individual counseling. I did a lot of consulting with teachers and parents. I made presentations in classes, like English classes, health classes, psychology classes in high school. And I also was seen as a support person to other teachers. And they come in, they come in with their own personal problems and say, I, I mean, I was not going to do a one-on-one -on -one counseling with them, but yeah. but refer them to where they could get help. Mm -hmm. So, what was your favorite part of your job as a school psychologist? Working with students. I just loved it. It was so hard to quit. And I wanted to quit. See, I started working when I was 48. I was yeah. really old. Uh, and, and I worked for 15 years until I was close to 63. But I wanted to quit while I was still doing well. So one of the awards that I got was Middle School Specialist of the Year one year when I was working yeah. at Lincoln. Uh, and that made me feel so good because it meant that the staff at Lincoln Middle School thought I had done a really good job and that then my name was thrown in the hat for the whole school district and it was thought I did mm -hmm. a good job all around. So that was one of the things. But um, I wanted to stop working while I was still doing a good job. I didn't want mm -hmm. people to say, oh, I wish the old bag had quit working. You know, mm -hmm. she just doesn't, can't cut the mustard anymore. So 
that's an old fashioned term anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, so so I did and the other thing that happened is my husband retired sort of early too mm -hmm. by the age of sixty. Uh, being a doctor just burns you out. Yeah. With those long hours and calls at home. So uh, and he was starting to do traveling. Well I love to travel. So there I would be tied to my job, and he'd be going off to Russia and Japan and other empty places. So I said, okay, I'm finally going to stop. And, uh, and oh, by the way, we've traveled to 15 European countries. We've traveled to Turkey twice and Egypt. We were part of a lacrosse sister city delegation that went to China for the mm -hmm. sister si sister city of Luoyang, China, and I've been in all states except Oregon, Alaska, and South Carolina. I don't know, I miss <laughs> South Carolina, but I miss that. Mm -hmm. So, I shouldn't ask this question, but what made you choose to be a psychologist? Because you said that it, choose, it chose you. Yeah, right. So. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, when I thought, I'm going to look into going back to graduate school, I think it's all right. I wanted to do something about kids' feelings and about the drugs and alcohol and all the other behavior that I saw. And and don't think that I'm, I, my husband and I have a cocktail every night, so it's <laughs> not that I'm against drinking, mm -hmm. but, yeah. but you need to learn how to drink in moderation so you yeah. don't get drunk and don't go binge drinking. Another bad thing I did was smoke, and therefore now as an older person, my lungs are in bad shape, but um, I loved smoking. It was my way of relaxing. So yeah. you know, you do those things for a reason. But anyway, I went over. I went to the local university. I couldn't leave La Crosse. I had to take something yeah. here <clears throat> because, <coughs> excuse me, I still had four kids at home at that point. Yeah. The oldest one was off in college, and my husband needed me too. So anyway. Uh, and I checked in the department that now has a health education major, but they didn't have a master's degree in that. I had had a bachelor's degree from that from oh, yeah. medicine. Did, did you go in the 50s then? Yeah, right. How was that like? Or? Well, uh, well, let, let me just, just oh, quickly yeah. finish this and I'll get back to that. Oh. Um, so, so I checked over there, and they didn't have a master's degree in health education at that point, and they were they were planning to have one, mm -hmm. but um, it I would have had to go back and take undergraduate chemistry and physiology and things that I thought no way am I going to be able to manage that? Maybe statistics if somebody teaches me algebra again, but but by then I knew the things I was good at, and that was writing talking, organizing. Um, uh, I, I was president of quite a few organizations because I was good at running meetings. I mean, I was good at that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So that I'd had a long amount of living and knew what I was capable of at that point. So uh, I said, okay, that's really too bad. Well, through the League of Women Voters, I knew three women whose husbands were in the psychology department at the oh, university. Okay. And so one of the husbands said, come on over and talk to us about school psychology. Well, my undergraduate degree, I didn't have to take many courses to qualify for being in that program. And they were willing to let me go part-time. It's a two and a half year um, a graduate program, a long graduate program mm -hmm. with lots of hours. But I could go, some of the classes were at night, I could go during the day mm -hmm. to some while my kids were in school, so that um, I did that program over about four years rather than two and a half years. So, and it worked out. I just loved it. It was absolutely perfect for me. And there's there's one article on that. You, oh, it's right here. Yeah, uh, that, that, that will tell about okay. why I chose school psychology. This is in the state, uh, the, the state department of public instruction newsletter. Yeah, you can okay. have, you know copy that sort of thing. All right, thank you. But oh, and yeah, I brought all this stuff over here. <laughs> anyway, we'll have someone scan it later. Yeah, yeah, so. and um, 
But in Madison, yeah, in the early 50s, when I graduated from Logan, there were three main careers that girls were being shoved into. What were they, do you think? Nursing, probably. Maybe teaching. Teaching, too. Mm -hmm. The third one. What you go into any office, what sex are almost all the oh, people? Oh, receptionist. Yeah, receptionist, secretary. <coughs> almost all girls. Mm -hmm. And so those were the three things that my friends and I were interested in. And my father, and so I kind of thought nursing would be kind of good. My father was on the Lutheran, on the Lutheran Hospital Board of Directors. Um, and so he got me a job as a nurse's aide. And I was 15. I could work part-time. And you didn't have to have any training. You just, yeah. uh, then you sure do know. Yeah, but, we do. So we anyway, I, I worked as a nurse's aide, and I loved doing it. But I thought, the guys who do everything and, and won the whole show are men. They're, they're doctors. Yeah. And I'm not going to be a nurse. It's different now. I wouldn't say the yeah. same thing now because nurses do lots of things now. But in those days, they were like waiting on the, on the male doctors. And I thought, I'm not going to do that all my life. So yeah. to heck with nursing. And nobody at that point said to me, hey, Rachel, you've got the ability to do well in school. You, your, your dad's a poor minister, so maybe you could get scholarships. I did get some scholarships, mm -hmm. but not. nobody pointed me in the direction of medical school. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, women's roles were very narrow in the mm -hmm. following World War II. Women had worked hard in lots of things during World War II in lots of non-traditional ways. And after World War II, uh, when the guys all came back from the service, and I'm not saying this is right and wrong, that's just the way it was, is women were then put back into the homes and say, raise a lot of family and, and be good at cooking and sewing yeah. and cleaning and, and decorating and be a good mom. Uh -huh. And I loved doing that. For 20 years I loved doing that. Well, I was about enough. Uh, and I loved being a mom, and I think I was a pretty good mom. But uh, so that in the early 50s, about oh, one fourth, maybe a third of the students mm -hmm. were women, but they were still mostly men. Now there are yeah. more women students in college than men. So that's all changed now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my grandma, she's 78 now, and or she's turning 78, and my grandpa, he had to go off to war, came back, and then they started raising families, I guess, after sure. he came back. In the La Crosse School District, you couldn't, except during the war, they made ex exceptions. Once you were married, you had to quit teaching. They didn't have married women other than when there was a shortage in a certain field. And certainly, when you became pregnant, you, the minute you thought you were pregnant, out, out the door you went. I mean, that was terrible for kids to see pregnant women, for heaven's sakes. Yeah. Not anymore, though. No, I know, last year. And I can't remember which of your two teachers. Was it Mrs. Halderson? Mrs. Mrs. Ramsey. Ramsey. Oh, Mrs. Ramsey. Okay, she was yeah. very pregnant at the end of the school year. Mm -hmm. She All just right. had it in September. Maybe. In September. So things have opened up tremendously, but mm -hmm. but in my family it was very important to get an education. I don't know if your grandmother would say the same, um, Chelsea. Yeah. But but when my immigrant grandparents came, they hadn't had an education. Maybe they, they had gone as they far did. as sixth I, or eighth grade. But I met them. I I can't really remember, but she talks about them. And and so to them just the way it is, or has been initially with Hmong families, mm -hmm. is that education is so important to them as far as how you get ahead in mm -hmm. a country that you've adopted. Yeah. So those, those uneducated grandparents had all six of their kids get some sort of education. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and, and, and they worked so hard to have the money to be able to send them to school. Yeah. So I have some more. What did you realize what you wanted to do with your life? Like totally 
Oh, okay. Yeah. I think they just. I was real uh, interested in boys in high school. <laughs> 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 and so one of the things I wanted to do was to get a husband someday. Uh, that was important to me. And the north side, and maybe it still is a bit, was the wrong side of the tracks. Mm -hmm. And, it, I mean, it was the working class part of town. And so, um, t and I was a minister's daughter, and I felt there were, there were lots of pressures placed on a minister's daughter. You were mm -hmm. supposed to be fairly perfect in your behavior. You weren't supposed yeah. to do anything wrong. You were supposed to behave very well. You were supposed to do well academically. You were supposed to memorize all the uh, commandments and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, but anyway, the North side, so that we felt kind of privileged being the minister's kids, but also there were pressures on us. Yeah. But uh, the pressure to get education was important, so that I was poor too, and I, I started by going to mm -hmm. school in La Crosse and saved money to transfer to Madison eventually. But when I was a senior in high school, this bouncy young man who still had braces on his teeth came to a Logan dance, and and he was looking for an old girlfriend, I think, but he found me instead. I was the only decent kind of older person there. <laughs> there were other younger kids there. I was a senior in high school, and he had come home from Madison and was going to school. He still had braces on his teeth. He needed his braces adjusted. And that's why he was in the cross. Well, he asked me to dance. <laughs> and the first thing he said was, where is everybody? And it was like, hey, I'm here, you know? <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, everybody was following a Logan basketball team on a field trip. But anyway, so that's how I met my husband. And we dated for about three and a half years before we finally got married. Because we, but, but once I met him, he, I kind of knew he was the guy. I dated lots of other guys, but he was just lots of fun. He had lots of interests, yeah. and uh, I liked him. Besides that, he was a Gunderson, and I thought, ooh, we might have a decent future here. <laughs> 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 so, um, did being a mother prepare you for being a child advocate in the school oh, district? Oh, you bet. Just excellently. Because I, first of all, I've been an advocate for my kids, mm -hmm. and most parents want really good things for their kids, and they're willing to do things, to, to pay money to have you have lessons and engage in sports and have decent clothes and, and um, you know, physical things as well as emotional things. Mm -hmm. So yes, and then within the school district, uh, and you'll see from the, the stuff I have from when I became, uh, when I was named Specialist of the Year. But there are all kinds of letters saying that I was a real advocate for kids. I really helped kids. Mm -hmm. I, I tried to find out. I, I never met a student who didn't have something special about him or her. Mm -hmm. And many people don't bother to look for that. But I bet I could spend half an hour with each one of you and find out. I know I'm talking my head off now. No, it's I was okay. very I good at listening and asking the right questions and finding out mm -hmm. something about you. While I'm on that subject, that's one of the things I would say to young people is try all kinds of things and find out what you're good at. And don't give up if you're not good at it right away. If you like it, then work hard to get better at it. And that can be anything from, in my case, to the degree it was writing, talking, uh, cooking, and, and baking. I'm really good in the kitchen. Uh, but but things that interpersonal kinds mm -hmm. of things. So, so find out about yourself. You may surprise yourself as you go through high school, maybe post high school education, to find out things you didn't even know were there about you. So the more people you talk to of all different ages, the more you listen to feedback people give you, 
the more you discover yourself from trying different things, the, the more you will know, number one, what you could be really, what you could really excel at, and number two, what makes you happy. And that's very important, and that you prepare yourself for some sort of work mm -hmm. that makes you happy. To go to work every day and not like what you're doing? Yeah. That would be so awful. <laughs> yeah, so, um, did you always want to help, or have you always been into helping others? I think I have. Um, and, and again, it may partly be that I was a middle daughter, older sister, younger sister, and then quite a bit younger brother. And um, so that I was, I always shared a bedroom. I never had my own bedroom. Um, I always shared a bedroom with older sister, younger sister. Um, we shared clothes. We, we passed down clothes. Did any of you? No, clothes are so cheap now. You all oh, have your own. No, I, I still get hand-me-downs from my cousin. And then, like, basketball clothes and stuff that I can wear to, like, practice and stuff. I might wear, like, my brother's old shorts. Well, good. So. Good. Because we use lots of money. Yeah. And then... Um, what advice would you give someone who doesn't know how to help or wants to help? I don't know. Like advice. Um, do, do any of you do volunteering? Yeah, I did. I try. Like Mitchell, yeah. what did you try? Um, well, my mom always, we do the Meals on Wheels thing. Oh, wow. Like Good for me. Yeah. That's very, very important thing. It helps people be able to continue to live in their own homes and be healthier than they would have been if they didn't have decent food. So that's very important. I, did, I don't know your name. Oh, Kaylee. Pardon? Kaylee. Kaylee. Okay. Have you done any volunteering? Not really. At a church? Right. In your neighborhood? <laughs> Well, I've done some, um, I've done, like, I don't know what it's called, the Salvation Army where you ring bells. Yeah, yeah. I've done that before, and I've done <coughs> some at my church. Okay. Well, we might change churches, so, I don't know. Okay. I know, and what about you? During Thanksgiving, I help at the cross there. Okay. Does that make you feel good to yeah. do that? See, that's, that's the advantage of doing some volunteering because it makes you feel good. And you can start really small. You can start doing something for a friend, doing something in the neighborhood, or then there, there are all kinds of organizations where you can do things. So, uh, and it doesn't have to be anything very big. It could start out in a very small way. How have your children inspired you with everyday life? Mm. Or how have you inspired your children? Yeah. I don't know what to do. Well, about. our five sons are pretty fantastic. Uh, four of them stayed in school until they got doctorate degrees, PhDs. Mm -hmm. Three of them are connected. I, I wrote down their names and their, what they do on the final page. And, um, three of them are professors and, and or do research at universities. Uh, a fourth one has uh, a PhD in political science theory, and he works for a foundation uh, doing stuff that's of interest in. Mm -hmm. And then the fifth one, Roald, like Roald Amundsen, um, is an architect and environmental designer. And he lives in Shipman Cooley, south of here. And he, um, he, he's not a traditional architect. He mm -hmm. works in sustainable architecture. And I can't even quite describe what he does. Have you ever heard of a place called the Biosphere? It's way before your time. It was um, this sort of like a habitat. Well, I have a, I have a uh, newspaper article about that in here too. Uh, when 
kids came back from, uh, okay, this is when I was on the Logan Hall of Fame, which I really am very proud of, too. Uh, uh, let's see. Ah, that's me when I graduated from high school. <laughs> Look at that. I still wear my hair so pretty. The same long way. Well, let's see. Uh, something. Oh, here. This was at my 60th birthday, so it's pretty old right now. But this is the two youngest sons and my husband. And all my kids come back for occasions like that. The youngest son, who's an astrophysicist, um, worked at the University of Miami. And he was going to Antarctica to the South Pole uh, for a three-month period to do research down there. And then that's the son who is the environmental um, architecture, architect, and he was working on this place called the Biosphere, which was in the desert in Arizona, where they made this uh, human environment, well, mimicking all the environments of the earth, and it was all under a glass dome, and they sealed people in there, they were going to live in there for two years and grow all their own food and everything. Well, it didn't work out perfectly, but anyway, he was part of that, so he's very futuristic sort of architecture. Okay. And I think now you'd probably call him a green architect. Uh, um, so. Oh, I have more questions. Um, when, do you have, when did you have time to do all of what you did? <laughs> well, number one, I do have I do, I used to have a fair amount of energy, and I think you need to. Well, now I'm making up for it by taking a nap every day, not having much energy, but I had lots of energy, I had lots of enthusiasm for things. I get really turned on by things, uh, so that uh, you make time. I, I had the house the household fairly well organized mm -hmm. so that that you um, you know things happened at certain times. One thing that I, I thought was important and I don't know how many families still do this, but it was important that we all get together at dinner time and mm -hmm. be together as a family. And uh, five kids eating together was was a big chunk, but we'd always wait for my husband to come home, mm -hmm. and they got impatient with that sometimes, of waiting that long. But as they got older, they were engaged in after-school activities, so that was okay, too. And we usually ate by candlelight in the dining room, and, and then we would talk, and everybody kind of report on what they did during the day. So that was the time we got together as a family. The more the longer I worked, the more that I saw people were eating on trays in front of TVs and, and or in their rooms. Yeah. They had their own TV and their own um, telephone and so on in their rooms, and families just got separated within the house where they all lived together. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, to me, was, it was pretty sad. And, yeah. and when you're together, even if you don't like each other for part of the time, Oh, one of the sons, the, the, the environmental guy, well, actually both of those were wrestlers. Three of my sons were wrestlers. And during wrestling season, he was a pain in the neck because he'd say, oh, I can't eat that. And when his father, being a pediatrician, was saying, you've got to eat that. You can't starve that. Well, I won't make weight for the next meet, you know, a wrestling match. And, and his dad would say, but that's not healthy for you. And so... Uh, you know, it's those kinds of conversations, too. But we were also supportive of it each other. Yeah. Listen to each other. So, uh, I'm going to find some more questions here. Okay. Um, do you still uh, visit Logan sometimes to see the changes? Yeah. I don't go back to Logan very often. And part of that was the first year... I wanted to give the person who replaced me a good chance to develop her own, uh, not, not to just be a clone of me, 
because I had been a fairly powerful school psychologist, especially at Logan. And part of that was my age and my experience raising my own family. Um, parents would come in, kids be in trouble, and I'd say, just hang with them, it'll get better. I picked up about son of mine at the police station. I mean, he made a huge mistake in high school. And, you know, he's got a PhD and teaches at Columbia Medical School at this point. Hang in there. Uh, and, and when they're the worst, that's when parents have to hang in the tightest. So, um, oh, I don't even know where I was going. Oh, yeah, do I go back? Um, so that, I, and the fact I'd grown up on the north side gave me, and, and was a graduate of Logan. All those things gave me lots of credibility there. So that I thought it was going to be tough and the person who replaced me. So I kind of stayed away for a while. And also it would have been kind of painful to go back because I would have missed it so much. <laughs> but I, I served on their Wall of Fame committee for a while, so I'd go there for meetings. And um, reunion things, they now hold a ranger rally at the Oktoberfest ground every summer. Mm -hmm. uh, so I go back to a few things like that. What was it like to be inducted to the Logan Hall of Fame, or Wall of Fame? It was the award that I made the most proud of. Because there were mostly, again, men on that wall. Mm -hmm. And to be uh, so honored by your school, for what you've done just made me feel so good. So how did you get picked to be in the mm. all the things? I think it was a combination of things that I worked there and was well thought of as a professional. Mm -hmm. And because I had been involved in all kinds of things in the community and even statewide, uh, there will be something here that says, uh, oh, I was, uh, this thing, where I was on the Educational Communications Board, which runs the state radio, uh, the state television and radio networks, mm -hmm. and I had been appointed to that by uh, Governor Earl. Um, so that, and, and in school psychology, I was president of the state organization. I was very proud of that, to, to, to head my professional organization. Um, so that was another thing I was really proud of. But that's why I'm, I'm featured in things like that newspaper mm -hmm. article, because I've been president of that organization. Uh, so that, that to be on the wall of fame, you have to have done something, you have to have done some pretty spectacular things. Mine were sort of cumulative. I had done so many things, being president of the, of the theater board several times, being on the board of the Family and Children's Center, the Riverfront Activity mm -hmm. Center. Um, I've done volunteer work at the Salvation Army, all these kinds of things. They just all kind of added up, and I said, well, you've been pretty busy <laughs> since you graduated from Logan. And then also, I was your book editor, too, at oh, Logan. Yeah. Uh, well, I've got, I've got that in there. Oh, I have to my sons, my kids, uh, kids and grandkids, and that was a year ago this month. Well, it'll be two years ago this summer. Uh, my husband and I were celebrating our 75th birthdays that year, so this was at our cabin up in Arnold, Wisconsin. And we've got two more grandkids since then, but, um, but that was a very happy time at that cabin. All the kids. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that's that's made me very sad is several of my sons have been divorced, mm -hmm. and uh, either they've been remarried or they found another partner of some sort. But th that has bothered me, and you know, I sort of say, what could I have done better? My husband and I've been married since 1950, 56 years as well. How how could I have? You know, been a better role model for them to mm -hmm. have them stay there. Well, one of my questions I was going to ask was, do you have certain morals that you believe in highly? And yeah, I do. Um, I believe in telling the truth. So honestly, mm -hmm. um, hmm. I do believe in helping other people mm -hmm. rather than just being selfish. Uh, but I 
some new vanilla, some more vanilla building. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I thought a lot before I answered that. Yeah, a lot of young yeah. people. Uh, I think this is by everyone. Being friends, and, and yes, the, as far as helping people, but, but friendships, and you don't have to have a lot of friendships, but I think it's important to have a few friendships that support you, somebody outside of your family that you can trust, so that the trust, that's very important, to be trustworthy, that, that if I tell you a secret, you keep that secret. Yeah. Being trustworthy, so I think that that's very important. And um, and and when you make a bargain, and marriage is a bargain, mm -hmm. that you stick with it at least as long as you can. And I'm not saying you stick with it if somebody's abusing you, or if it's a terrible life for everybody. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, I think a mistake people make is they say, oh, it's going to be too hard to get counseling or work at changing a relationship, and so they just throw it away. And it's much harder to start over a new and try another relationship. Yeah. So why not use some of that energy and discomfort to work on making that relationship better? Okay. Well, I think we're about to finish up. This podcast was brought to you by School in the Cooley students at Longfellow Middle School in La Crosse, Wisconsin.